infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smeltzer. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me on episode number five, where we talk to Will Lake, who is the Vice President of Sales at the Asian Corporation, formerly in situ form technologies. Will has over nine years of engineering and construction management experience. We talk about infrastructure funding gap. We talk about the difference from book smart engineering and real world out in the field experience you get in construction. I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you for joining me. Hi, everyone. My name is Chad Smeltzer, and I am the CEO and founder of BigCurement.com. Today, we're on the Infrastructure Hot Seat podcast. I have with me a guest, uh, Will Lake, who's with in situ form technologies joining us to talk about his world out there with uh, curtain place lining and and he's going to give us the introduction as far as what in situ form technologies is currently doing thanks for joining us will hey thanks for having me on give us a little introduction a little background of yourself where you uh started where'd you go to school that kind of thing sure yeah so i've been in construction for 12 years uh, most of that in operations and now in a role as the vice president of sales for Institute Form. Um, I'm a civil engineer from Ohio State uh, and have worked in several different parts of the industry, started in energy construction um, and then also moved to the municipal space and then back to some specialized demolition and now back in Institute Form in the municipal space again. So um, seeing a little bit of, of different aspects of the industry and, and I certainly enjoyed all my stops along the way. Nice. That's, that's, that's amazing history you got going on there. So you went to school with engineering, you got an engineering background, correct? That's right. And then you decided to get away from engineering and go right into construction. Can you explain a little bit more of why you decided to get out of engineering? Yeah, sure. So I always uh, have been around construction. My family uh, was a contractor. I've been around it, you know, since I was five or six years old. So always something I was interested in. Um, Engineering was 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 certainly the technical side of things that I was interested in, and, and frankly, anyone that could, you know, even if you say you know what you want to do when you go to college, you really have to have to get your hands in it before you really know for sure. And so, as I got towards the end of college, um, and was just talking with future employers, I just didn't like the idea of sitting behind a desk, you know, all day every day, um, and, and without really laying hands on on real work that's being done. Uh, and so, I had some some really unique internship experiences that. Uh, it kind of made me fall in love with the, the in the field and, and you know, dirt on boots kind of action. Um, and so it was a natural fit out of college and, and so far so good. It's, uh, I've enjoyed my time. Nice. In the industry. Yeah, that's great, man. That's, that's awesome. So a lot of what, uh, you know, I've seen in the past as far as construction goes and, and engineering, there's always two sides of, of the opinion of, of how to actually build something you know, book versus out in the real world in the field. So uh, what have you seen the difference between obviously field construction versus like what you read and, and learn in books in your engineering you know, background? What what are some of the struggles there right now that's that's currently going on? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. I think that, um, you know, things can certainly be built on paper much differently than they can be built in the field. Um, and so right. it, both of those are difficult jobs. Uh, and I have a lot of, of good friends that, that, that certainly are design engineers and, and, and they live in that space and I live in this one. Um, so it, it, both, both are challenging. I think that the experiences that I've had that have been the best on jobs that have worked out well or designs that have, have played out or when they're put together with uh, not just the concept of how those things need to operate long term, but how they're going to be built, and how they're going to be maintained. Um, and so you know, for example, mechanical piece could work perfectly, but how are you going to get into access it to repair it 10 years from now when it needs new bearings or it needs a new motor? So I think that the right. more those, those concepts can be worked into design, the better off it, it plays. Uh, in my experience, the engineers that, that do the best job of that are the ones that get out from behind the desk and, and get out and actually see it in, in action and talk to the guys that actually, um, you know, get their hands dirty every day working on it. Um, that, that yeah. combination of skills and experience usually it gets you to the best outcome. Do you think that, uh, you know, during your education to get your engineering degree, do you think it would be worth it that they put that curriculum in there so they 
should have engineering, you know, people that want to get into engineering go out actually and spend a year or two out in the field? Do you think that's something they should put in the curriculum? Yeah, it's a really good, really good point. I mean, I think at Ohio State, um, you know, I felt like I got a really good education and, and they certainly pushed the internship and co-ops uh, through the summers. Okay. And, and I learned uh, as much, if not more in those, you know, those three or four summers than I did uh, in the classroom, just because you can, you can only take the technical knowledge so far uh, and you eventually have to go out and see it actually plays in the real world. So I think that, I think that that's a good step. Um, there's, there's definitely discussion in the construction industry on, you know, it does a four-year degree get you ahead of where a four-year apprenticeship program gets you? Um, and I think those are interesting debates. Um, I, I think every person has kind of got their own lane to, to fill in, but uh, certainly yeah. for me, the technical background and then the, the hands-on experience was was what kind of worked for my personality and, and kind of how my brain works. Um, I'm sure it's different for others, but certainly I would highly encourage everyone to at least see both sides of it. Um, and then you may hate one side, but at least you've seen it and, and you have some appreciation for the work that goes into it. Right. Yeah. I, that makes total sense. Um, you know, just having that extra background that you have makes, uh, makes a big difference when you get out there and, um, you know, helping these construction guys who are, you know, you know, kind of going in the pivoted, you know, into, skilled labor right now is a huge problem. So having you as a resource going out in the field and being able to educate some of these new guys, I imagine you guys are hiring left and right and you have sure. to train up these guys. Is that currently what's going on out, out in the industry? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, our company, our industry uh, is in the same boat as, as the majority of construction right now, which is that, you know, there's just not enough skilled talent. Um, there's a lot of experience that's retiring or close to the end of their career. Um, and so that it, you know, that's difficult to, to kind of transport that knowledge into new people. Um, in, in general, there's a lot of companies that are bringing some, you know, some light to it now, but you know, the industry has done uh, frankly a pretty poor job for a decade or more of, of really not training people enough uh, and trying to get by with the bare minimum. And so, you know, that bears out in results, but I think that the, the companies that stay at the top probably do the best job of, of training people and, and, and really the companies that continue to keep that talent pipeline open whether they're full or, or need work or not, right? It's, we always kind of preach the, the overstaffing model, uh, which has been really difficult lately, but, you know, hiring more than yeah. you need to keep people trained, you have a bench. Um, those are important concepts and they're certainly difficult. You know, when, when the financial times are, are more difficult, it's hard to, to make those investments. Um, but I think that we'll see more of that. And hopefully the industry improves as a whole. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, so how are you guys recruiting? Like, how are you getting people to come on board with Institute Porn? Yeah, good question. So we use several uh, outside services. Uh, I mean, it's really an all hands on deck approach, right? So I mean, it's, uh, you know, a lot of recruiting services, we have in-house recruiters as well, but really, I mean, and I think this is consistent across the industry, but referrals are our, are our best way to get good people. Um, you know, it's, it's family members, it's friends, um, and, and certainly to, for that to work, um, the company's got to take care of your people, right? If you want, if you want people to be recommended and referred in, you've got to be treating those existing employees well. And so, you know, I think that certainly I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel like they take care of their employees. Um, but I think that in general, every company can always do more. Um, and so I think that we'll, we'll continue to see that. And certainly the last couple of years have really changed people's approach, um, to what they want in a career. And so one aspect of our business is travel uh, and, you know, crews are out on the road and they're in hotels. Um, you know, I think that's certainly less appealing now than it was maybe just two or three years ago. Um, and so there's just different things to kind of bridge and make sure you find the right person um, that, you know, you're being honest about what the job's going to entail, uh, you know, how they're going to be compensated. And then hopefully you find somebody that, that it fits. Um, and right. we do a good job, again, several other companies do this as well. But we have a step up program. So, you know, I, for me, I've always wanted to see where that next step in my career would be. Uh, and whether you come in as a laborer or you come in as an engineer, or really any position in between, um, I think it's important you always give somebody that that roadmap, that ladder to, if you want to step up in your career, here's what you need to do. And, and this is the position and what it looks like. So, um, you know, a lot of communication on that front. and um, But no secret yeah. sauce. It's hard to find good people. It always has been. And uh, it's definitely difficult right now. Yeah. Do you think uh, it's because obviously the retirement is, is, you know, intellectual knowledge and everything, people are retiring. Um, but do you think we just uh, lax on vocational tech schools, things like that, that we really didn't educate in, you know, 
carpentry anymore. You know, when I was in school, we had industrial arts and things like that. <laughs> All that seems to be gone now. Is, is that where you think we, sh- you know, how do we fix that problem, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a gap. I mean, I think a lot of this is is perceptions. Um, and it's certainly not a unique idea for me. But I mean, I, I think that college is, you know, we, we've shamed people into into going to college uh, when, a, when a number of people just, it's not a great path for them. Um, and, and just education, really the options outside of what a college, you know, path looks like. Um, so, I mean, I, again, in my, my first couple of years out of school, I worked with some, some fantastic tradesmen. Uh, I worked up in uh, Alberta, Canada for, for a year in uh, oil sands and, and deal with really, really skilled tradesmen. Um, you know, some of the best pipe yeah. fitters all over the world and, and best welders and, um, and guys that, that knew that that was there because that's a huge industry in Alberta. And so they knew that, Hey, I knew since I graduated high school, I was going to go into this trade school. I apprenticed here, apprenticed here. And, you know, I, and now I'm making, you know, 300 grand a year. Um, and so you're like, Oh, you know, that's, that's a thing, right? Like, I, I don't think in America that we talk about that enough that you can make really, really good money, um, and really do a really fulfilling job, um, working in construction. And so I, hopefully some of the stigma to that, um, you know, kind of declines over the next couple of years, but there's some really, really smart, uh, skilled, you know, just great, uh, you know, just craftsmen that are, that are out in construction that are, that are great to work with. And so it's a, it's a good industry, but a lot of education needs to happen so that people are aware of it. Right. Yeah. You know, with all these apprenticeship programs and stuff that are out there, it's a good way to start getting your feet wet in the industry. And, you know, like you said, it is a it, infrastructure is a great paying uh, place to be if you're looking to sure. just to, you know, move your life up and, you know, want to, you know, get more things, buy more things, you know, stuff like that. You want to advance uh, your careers. Uh, so that being said, you since you said that you were in the oil and gas industry, now you're in the underground infrastructure, underground trenchless infrastructure, really. Uh, what's some of the differences between yeah. oil and gas and, and infrastructure underground? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, I mean, energy as a whole, when it's good, it's, it's fantastic. And when it's bad, it's, it's really terrible. Um, and so, uh, we were, my timing was interesting. I came out, uh, and, and joined the kind of the energy construction world, not long after the horizon oil rig disaster in the Gulf. So permits were pulled in the U.S., hence why I worked in Canada for a year and bounced around. So I lived in six states, uh, two countries, and had seven different job titles in my first two years out of college. Um, wow. So that's, <laughs> I mean, that's nuts, right? Um, got a ton <laughs> of experience a right out the gate. Um, but there's certainly a life, you know, that you, you give up a portion of your life. And uh, we worked 18 days straight and three days off. And, and you've lived in man camps in North Dakota and some things that just really aren't you know, I wouldn't put them on a postcard, um, but it, you know, really cool, cool experience. Um, and then moved to municipal just to really get something that was a little more stable for me personally. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of big differences in those. Um, but one thing about infrastructure specifically, um, and then I'll come up you know, non-energy infrastructure is that it's really steady and stable. So, the, the federal money, the state money, the county money is it's extremely consistent. It's, it's always grows year over year, you know, slightly, there's hardly any big peaks and valleys. And so you can really yeah. plan around, you know, not only your business, but around, you know, your career and understanding, you know, where the work is going to be. Um, I, I had never heard of cured in place pipe, uh, or trenchless construction before I started working here. Um, and so uh, again, it's something that we talk about inside the company all the time and inside the industry that you know, you've just got to educate people on the options out there. Um, right. you know, I've loved my time at this company and in the industry and, uh, and something that, you know, frankly, I just lucked into. And so, you know, I, I think that social media allows us to, to kind of get the word out on a lot of things. And so that, that's a great place to, you know, kind of elevate the cool stuff we do and, and, and that great people we work with and, and, and let people know that it's a good option for their career. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great point. Um, so talking about infrastructure, kind of staying on that topic, um, you know, with the report that comes out from ACE, uh, you know, American Society of Civil Engineering, what they gave us a C minus rating. I think the previous four years, it was a D rating. Uh, so what is your perspective on the infrastructure now, especially obviously in underground, you know, pipes, uh, sewer pipes to be more specific, 
what is your take on the industry now? Because there's 800,000 miles of uh, estimated you know, sanit- sewer, sanitary sewer pipes, I believe. So in general, storm pipes are going to be close to that. So we're almost dealing with 2 million feet of or miles, I should say, of, of yeah. pipe. What is your perspective on the estimates and the, the grading uh, from the civil engineers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's real. Um, you know, there was a there was a really nice special done, I think, by the History Channel, maybe five or six years ago called the, the Crumbling of America. And it, and it went through kind of the infrastructure of different blocks. And um, it's a really sad story, frankly, and there's a lot of work to be done. And so I think one of the struggles that utilities and, and specifically, you know, we talk about sanitary sewer, water, storm pipes, you know, anything that people don't see every day, uh, it's hard to get them excited about it. Um, politicians, it's not. It's not sexy to, to fix a sewer pipe. You're not going to get a lot a lot of street cred from that from your from your voting base. Um, so I think that we always, you know, from a from a visibility standpoint, a big bridge, a new highway, those are things that people want to put their name on. Um, but there's a lot of things in our infrastructure that just allow us to be a first world country. So water, sewer, electricity, those are all you know, basic needs that are largely, you know, I don't want to say ignored, but certainly not on the, not on the top of everyone's mind. And so. That's a struggle to get funding, um, but I think that, you know, Frank, when we see disasters and we see we see issues, it, it's always a, a you know, kind of a reactive spend. So, you know, the, the recent industry topic is Jackson, Mississippi, where they're you know they're not going to be able to provide water for their community, um, and and Frank, right. there's an honest admission from from some of their their local leadership that they've just been kicking the can down the road and hadn't been doing the, ma- the maintenance they needed to. So, that's not going to be yeah. a unique story. Unfortunately, we're going to hear a lot more of that. Um, and so from us, I, you know, we have, we have good solutions and, and certainly we know that we can improve. We've, you know, we've lined over 25,000 miles of pipe uh, in our company history, um, but there's a lot more to do to your point. So you know, from us, the, there's a huge need, but um, really from a, from a constituent and, and even really local leadership standpoint, um, there's just got to be, you know, the volume and the heat kind of turned up um, to get the stuff fixed before it becomes really catastrophic in some places. Yeah, no, you're spot on, man. That's a, there's a huge gap, but you know, in, in this whole infrastructure world, we're out of sight, out of mind, like you said, and, uh, we need to just have more information about the infrastructure. And, you know, one thing that was surprising to me is that on some of that reporting from the, you know, the, the civil engineers, basically they estimate everything, you know, they're estimating every four years, the infrastructure channels, so to speak of all the different types of infrastructure and the fact that we're estimating is amazing to me still in 2022, you know, that's how archaic. (laughs) So maybe this pivots us right into like infrastructure procurement because we're, we're estimating a lot of the infrastructure that's out there. And what is your perspective on like the engineering estimates, you know, every four years we're evaluating it, but we're estimating it and you know, the procurement cycle, like what's going on there. What's your take on some of that stuff? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, on the procurement side, I mean, um, I should step back. So technology's come a huge way in construction in the last, you know, five, 10 years. Um, the majority of my clients, the majority of municipal clients, government clients um, have a system that they've used and they're going to continue to use it, even if they openly admit that there's something better out there. And so that's a real struggle. Um, change is hard. Uh, change is really hard inside of your know, bureaucratic groups. Um, and so that's an overall I think, struggle that we all have. Um, it, from the procurement side and just the processes, I've talked to several clients recently where, you know, you talk about uh, their current system and what it can handle and how much money they can push through and how many jobs they can manage at a time and then what needs to be done and then the gap between those. And, and in some cases, just like, hey, you just need more people or you need more money uh, to do these things. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's that, hey, your system doesn't work. You're going to have to you're gonna have to reinvent your your procurement system, the way that you let out contracts, the way that you you know qualify contractors. Um, and so there's there's really the full spectrum across the country. Um, some clients have done a really good job in staying you know kind of up to date and and you know looking further than just this year, but looking five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, right. Unfortunately, that's not that's not the case everywhere. Um, and so a, as you know, it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, we work with clients. You know, yeah. five thousand person towns all the way up to you know the largest cities in the country, um, and it's just a mixed bag of, of what you see in all those places. Um, the common theme, though, is that really no no area from our perspective is overspending on infrastructure. 
most people are doing either what is required or the bare minimum. And, you know, many are actually not even doing that. And so it, this can only last so long. This stuff catches up with you at some point. Um, hopefully, hopefully yeah. we interact uh, before that happens. Yeah, it's a huge gap, the infrastructure gap. I was just looking at it before we started our podcast and it's it's trillions, $2.59 trillion gap over the next, they said by 2039, I believe in that report that uh, we have, uh, it would affect $10 trillion on our GDP. That just a gap alone as we keep not addressing it and just keep it as is. <laughs> so we're, we're heading down a really interesting path uh, as the Jackson, Mississippi, you brought up that, you know, this is time bombs just waiting around, uh, you know, Flint, Michigan was another time bomb just waiting, sure. you know, it, all these things are just time bombs. And that, that goes back to, you know, you, what do you think about the state of contractors right now? And you mentioned accountability in your conversation there. What did you mean by that? Like what's going on right now with contractors? Cause I had, some very interesting experiences when I was doing rehabilitation with manholes and stuff where there were some shady contractors out there. <laughs> what do you think about the contractors in the industry? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, there's certainly a, a group that, you know, that probably don't represent our industry as well as, as I would like. Um, I think that in general contractors have, uh, you know, kind of a bad rap and I, I'm, obviously biased because I've been one my whole career and, and grew up in a family of contractors. And so I've, I've always had a different viewpoint, but I think that people are shocked to understand the level of risk they take on and just, you know, what's, you know, we talk about estimating. So you know, every day we estimate what something's going to cost two years from now to build and, and hope that we can build it for that price when it actually comes around. So that's day-to-day -day life for us. But I think to your point, I think what we'll see is that, you know, in, in the municipal space specifically, you know, they've been a low bid uh, contractor awarder for a long time. And so regardless of who your company is, how long it's been around, you know, what your qualifications are, if you have the low price, you're going to get the contract. Um, we're starting to see some companies in the space kind of kind of pivot from that and move to a what I would consider a best value model where you're going to qualify contractors, uh, you know, before you're going to open their price. So you make sure they have a level of competency uh, before they're awarded the work. Um, that's certainly something that we encourage. And I think that it's, it's beneficial for the clients. Um, you know, it's going yeah. back to my energy days. We saw that a lot in, in energy. So when I worked for Exxon and on shell projects and Hess, um, they were interested. It, price was pretty far down the list, actually, right? There were a lot of things that they wanted the box checked before they actually started talking about numbers, um, and, and right. safety and quality and experience were all were really at the top of those lists. Um, and so that hasn't really filtered into the, into the public space as much as I would like. Um, but I think again, it, it's, it's a matter of time and we're starting to see some small progress there, but, um, you know, really if you, if you give qualified contractors, um, you know, if you pay them for your, for their experience, frankly, then, then the end result is, is much more favorable than, than unfortunately some of those bad actors that come in with a low price and then, and, you know, maybe try to take advantage of a, of a client after the fact, um, but I would hope that's not as prevalent as maybe some people think it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point because it, it, what it, you know, what I've learned is that the contractors get the low bid and now we deter um, some of our business development reps from going after certain government buyers or, or, you know, wanting to work with them because all it is is low bid for them, not quality of service or, you know, quality of, workmanship. And that's where we see a huge problem. The government buyers, I don't think really realize is that when you take low bid like that, you just discourage really good companies from wanting to even work with you. And you know, that, that, that's a big problem. I think it is in the industry worldwide or yeah, worldwide or just in the United States, it's, it's a huge issue where the procurement system is, is really just archaic, uh, very fragmented. You know, if you're going to take low bid, you're going to get the lowest workmanship. I mean, in my mind, that's the way I kind of look at it. You're going to get what you pay for, so to speak. Um, yeah. You mentioned something about, go ahead. So, no, so I, I, mean, I think that they get what you pay for is, is a real thing. Um, and, and yeah, I think that clients would be certainly, they would benefit from, from structuring that differently and getting qualified contractors. That's, that's our opinion as well. And that's one of the, the, the joys of working for a company that's been around for 50 years is that, as you know, a lot of, a lot of companies are two or three year companies and, 
that 10 year warranty may not scare them or something else may not scare them. But, um, you know, when you've got a name and a reputation to protect, I mean, I think that companies take a different approach, but the system doesn't, doesn't necessarily, um, award you for that type of behavior. Right. I mean, it, it's still a little bit. And so you have to kind of work around it. Right. Yeah. The, the fact that we have to work around it is a problem. You know what I mean? We shouldn't have to, it should be based on your skill set, Like you said, and are you a responsible bidder or not? You know, that kind of stuff. Let's talk about, uh, we got like six minutes left. Let's talk about safety in the industry. Underground trenchless is notorious for, you know, fixing large diameter sewers. And we, you know, over the past five years that I can remember, we had at least one person die here at the Chicago area. Um, by putting in a liner. What's your perspective on safety in the industry right now? And are we really, is there a lot of contractors out there that, that make don't make safety a priority? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. I mean, I think that, again, when you talk about, you know, kind of the atmosphere that's created, um, you know, municipal contracts don't always have the highest visibility, uh, where if you're building, you know, a large casino or, you know, a plant rate, you're going to have, you know, OSHA reps on site every day and, and you know, probably a large safety team uh, municipal works, it, you know, you're kind of jumping around. And so it can be kind of hard to have visibility of what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, I think we've seen a fatality in our industry or at least related to manhole entry um, about every year, which is shocking. Um, and so certainly we, we have processes that, you know, we, we try to ensure and, and we do have one of the best safety records in the industry. But it, it as you would agree, it's just bad business to hurt people, right? I mean, that's there's, there's no benefit to that. And so um, what I, I think we've seen, though, is, is maybe some lag um, between both clients and, and overall standards to kind of keep, keep setting that bar higher and higher. And so I know that we've worked directly with OSHA to help you know, kind of recreate some standards that were just outdated. But um, again, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and it's not the big, the big project that's drawn a ton of eyes. And so I think it allows for people to be a little more lax. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's people that, you know, that do things in a way that, that, that we don't agree with. But I think that that's it speaks again to the business and just what your what your priorities are. Um, so I, I think that overall, like when we talk about uh, manhole entry and we talk about confined space, it's it, people just don't realize how dangerous it is. Um, and so it, it, it entering large pipes without a way to get someone out. I mean, there's lots of gases that like a lot of bad things can happen. Um, and so it's just again, it's just an education piece. And I think if clients really understood kind of that full uh, impact of what could go wrong, then I think they would take it more seriously than they do. Right. Right. That's true. It's, you know, it's, it's still dangerous. Like you said, and confined space entry is a big deal um, going underground like that. And it's very dangerous. Let's talk about inflation. We got like three minutes left. How's inflation impacted your, your business in general right now and the infrastructure bill. So you're dealing with inflation and you got all this funding coming in to fix pipe. How are you guys handling all that? Yeah, a lot of different components. So, I mean, the, the infrastructure bill, we're still interested to see what the impact that is. And there's always a timing component to see when that money actually starts hitting, uh, you know, hitting the clients, and they start planning in advance for that. But we're, we're hopeful that's a step in the right direction. Uh, ARPA funds as well. Uh, the Recovery Act also gave some some smaller towns that were impacted some some extra money that could be spent for infrastructure as well. So we've seen, you know, some some people come up with money that maybe they historically don't have to do jobs, which is great. Um, and then inflation has been a big piece. So at least in the procurement system, as you know, you know, typically we may work with clients a couple of years in advance to, to, you know, to help them plan their project. And then they're going to go get a, a budget approved for that. And then maybe a year and a half, at least one year, but usually, you know, sometimes several, the jobs actually bid. Um, the last two years have been very rough. So a lot of, a lot of projects have had uh, low engineer estimates, which means low budget, uh, which means that they can't award the full, the full contract. Um, and so we've worked with clients, certainly some places that have really been effective, but again, we're, we're losing ground, right? If they can't award it because of their system, then that job goes back into the funnel and yet they go get the money, but that's still work that's, that's delayed and not getting done. Um, so that's been an interesting impact. Um, you know, certainly we're trying to work with our clients to help them understand how much our prices, you know, how much our costs have gone up. Um, and that's a yeah. kind of a bag of reactions, but I think overall, most people understand, you know, the unique times that we've gone through. Um, and so that hopefully that, that begins to level. I think we all hope that that starts to level out soon. Um, but really, I think that it's just yeah. an education piece. And again, the system only allows them to award what they have in our budget. And 
Unfortunately, although inflation's at 10%, most of our clients' budgets have not increased 10%. And so they're just able to do less work for the current prices. And so again, we're, we're, we're not really heading in the right direction. Um, all these people really need to do more work. And so it's just another kind of headwind that, that the industry has to deal with. So you haven't really seen much change since the infrastructure bill was passed. That's, it, that's what you're, that's what it sounds like. You haven't really. Yeah, seen absolutely. Much. I mean, we, we expect yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's sooner, but uh, you know, we expect next year maybe to start seeing some okay. uh, money flow, but I mean, frankly, it, in my best guess is maybe a year from now, it starts to, you know, kind of, kind of filter through. But what we are seeing is there's a lot of design activity happening now. So obviously that has to happen before we're going to have projects to build. And so I think that we're, we're going to see it. Um, and we saw something similar back in 2009, 2010 um, in the Recovery Act there. So I think that, you know, we're certainly hope that it's a benefit um, and we'll see how much of it trickles down to our, our section. Yeah. No, that's it. That's interesting to to know. And I, I wanted to talk more about the uh, the estimated engineering estimates being completely off <laughs> due to inflation. But we're pretty much out of time, Will. So we'll have to come back around and we'll chat another time because I feel like we can talk for another thirty minutes at least. So, Will, if there's any way to inter- information, how to contact in situ form if they're looking to you know fix their infrastructure as well as your contact information, if you could share that with us, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our website, uh, www.insituform.com is a great place for company information. And then certainly anyone can, uh, can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, Will Lake, and hopefully you can, you can find me and love to connect and and see what we can do to to help solve their problems. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time. Truly appreciate it. You're, you brought a lot of wisdom to, uh, the podcast today and I hope people benefit from it. So have a great one and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Chad. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmelzer. 